Ark Raiders is a new multiplayer-focused yet atmospheric game from Embark Studios, makers of The Finals, and it is notably different than many Unreal Engine 5 games. It does not use the engine's hallmark features, and user reports and buzz online have been hyping how this game gets around having typical UE5 issues. So what's the deal with Ark Raiders' technical quality? Is the game really saved from typical UE5 pitfalls in performance and visuals like commenters online would suggest? Let's find out with some Digital Foundry investigation. The big holiday discount season is upon us, with MSI bringing some of its biggest savings ever. Check out discounts on MSI displays, including critically acclaimed QD OLEDs like the MPG272URX and the MPG321URXW. But there's more. Grab up to $100 off MSI graphics cards and up to $150 off MSI motherboards, cases and coolers while stocks last. Click on the link in the video description below for more details. Let's answer the first part of the question by talking about performance and specifically CPU performance and fluidity as this is an area where so many Unreal games have just failed incredibly over the last few years. Getting into game on a high-end PC for testing equipped with a 9800X3D CPU, it was plain to see that the game spent only a very short amount of time pre-compiling shaders during the onboarding process. In total, just about 20 seconds on this beefy CPU while I was configuring settings and signing up to play by using a in-game user ID. In a normal Unreal Engine game, I would be extremely concerned by such a short pre-compilation step, but as always, it's best just to play the game to see actually how it shakes out. Loading up max settings, including maxed out RTX GI, I head off in game with 4K DLSS 4 Transformer Performance Mode on the RTX 5090, targeting 120 FPS. Here I'm purposely using Performance Mode for DLSS to rule out any possible GPU limitedness at this target frame rate. After having played the game at those settings and frame rate lock for four hours on five different maps with varying weather and time of day, I can confidently say that Arc Raiders generally has a much smoother frame time performance than many other UE5 games on this CPU hardware. I did not see a single instance of shader compilation stutter, and in my four hours of play on the configuration, I only had three times when the frame time and frame rate deviated on the frame time graph I was recording. Just three times in four hours of standard play. The usual gameplay loop requires you to traverse very large maps, open up little loot containers, avoid arc robots, or defend yourself against them if you happen to alert the robots and do not have the chance to escape. You can also, of course, team up with other players, or be hunted by other players, or hunt those players yourself if you really feel like it. None of these gameplay related things caused measurable frame time issues with an FPS cap on. This all in spite of the engine it's running on and a relatively short shader compilation step. This outward appearance of a perfect frame time is indeed very very rare for any game claiming to run on Unreal Engine, and I think it would be great to examine what is happening here. Typically, even on this beastly CPU setup, traversing large game worlds in an Unreal Engine game will cause frame time spikes, some of which, which would tend to be greater than 16 or even 33 milliseconds long on this CPU in my testing of many Unreal Engine 5 games. So let's examine a little bit further. Using the game's internal metrics, gives us great insight into its performance when we unlock the frame rate and reduce the internal resolution even further while having reflex off to prevent other capping from occurring. Looking at the GPU frame time here, we can see that the GPU is capable of pumping out a frame at around 3.9 milliseconds per frame or around 4.0 milliseconds per frame. Looking at GPU utilization, it is in the very high 90s, which is typical for indicating GPU limited performance on an RTX 5090. It never really gets to a full 100 usually on this GPU. Then we have the game CPU time for gameplay code and the CPU render time for all those rendering related CPU tasks. There we can see game CPU time is around two milliseconds here, while render time is around 3.4 milliseconds. These run in parallel and are not added together. Due to some overhead not addressed in these frame time metrics here, perhaps driver or otherwise, the game is actually GPU limited to around 4.6 milliseconds and has a frame rate above 200 FPS. With the game code and CPU render time here being sub 4 milliseconds, that means the Ryzen 7 9800X3D is crunching through all its CPU related tasks extremely quickly. If it wasn't GPU limited here, the game could potentially 
nearly run at 300 FPS on the CPU alone. So yeah, the 9800X3D is doing an amazing job here, and the game's running really well. Let us run around the game world though, to get a more accurate look at what the actual gameplay is like on the CPU. If we pay attention to the game's provided render time metrics again, and GPU utilization, and compare them with CPU times, we can see that the game's statistics show that the 9800X3D is essentially never limiting game performance. The game appears to be GPU limited even at this extremely low res and very high frame rate. That is what the game metrics say though at least, but paying attention to the real output frame times while the frame rate is unlocked paints a slightly different picture. It's actually not too hard to find CPU related traversal stutters when fully unlocking the frame rate on this CPU. Playing with an unlocked frame rate like this at the max settings with a low resolution, I actually found more than a dozen traversal stutters while traversing the map in 30 minutes of play. They were usually within the 16 millisecond range at worst, spiking up from the comparatively low 4 to 6 millisecond average output frame time. Now that is not exactly so so many in comparison to other Unreal Engine games, but apparently using FPS locks like I did to 120 help minimize their appearance on frame time graphs, perhaps by decreasing possible contention, or by increasing headroom on the CPU, or plainly by buffering. Another reason why FPS locks reduce visible frame time stutters on traversal is because FPS locks apparently shift stutters from real frame time on frame time graphs that you could record yourself to the stutters instead being visible in game animation. Now we've talked about this a couple times before, but sometimes you don't actually have a frame time stutter, but instead an animation stutter in games like this. While playing the game with an FPS lock at 120 FPS for over four hours, there were a number of times while playing the game where I thought I saw a hitch occur but combing through my footage afterward showed frame time graphs that were perfect with no issues. But if I go back through that footage again and look at the animation and not the metrics, you can see sometimes that the animation stops and hitches while the frame is still rendered, just with the incorrect animation time, aka animation error, which you might have heard of recently on Gamers Nexus. So you can have a perfect frame time graph, but you can then have improper animations, which look to stutter. The game has traversal stutters for sure, but depending upon how you play the game, either unlocked or with a locked frame rate, these stutters will either manifest in the real output frame time or in the game's animation system. This becomes much more visibly obvious the lower end your CPU is. Playing the game on a Ryzen 5 3600, a low and old CPU, over the course of a three hour block of play with 60 FPS, I actually recorded zero frame time issues according to recorded FCAT metrics. But just playing the game, subjectively, it definitely looked like it had a number of hitches at times when running around. So metrics you record can look fine, but if you actually look at the animation, it can have obvious hitches in it, like here while running forward. The camera stops and hyper accelerates, but the real output frame rate and frame time are still good looking. If we unlock the frame rate on this CPU, we can potentially see why this is the case. With an unlocked frame rate, the average frame rate at times on a Ryzen 5 3600 is scarcely above 60 FPS while CPU limited and the frame times definitely have a craggy look to them, with a number of frame times hanging around that 25 millisecond point at times. This indicates small hitches when traversing the game's terrain, so depending upon how you lock the game or don't, stutters either show up in real frame time or they show up in animations. With this being said, I think I can answer at least one part of the question put forth at the beginning of this video. Arc Raiders is not actually completely saved from at least one common Unreal Engine pitfall, as close analysis shows. It does indeed have traversal stutters, to a degree and they either manifest in frame time or having animation look incorrect. Still with that being said, I would say this game is far higher quality than the average Unreal Engine release in this CPU area. While playing the game over a total of 8 hours on two different configurations, I did not see a single instance of shader compilation stutter, both on a low end and a high end CPU, and that is definitely not typical in UE games where many developers absolutely fail in that department. I would also like to praise the average CPU performance on a higher end kit. There are a lot of objects and things scattered in this world, and if you ignore the frame time spikes on traversal boundaries, then you'll see that CPU performance on the high end is tremendous. On a 9800X 3D, the game flies with having base CPU frame times in the 3 to 5 millisecond range. And that goes to show how the game's base gameplay code and rendering code is ultra efficient, barring those traversal boundary moments that I just talked about. So in total, I would say Arc Raiders fares a great deal better than most UE releases in regard to typical CPU related pitfalls, though it is not without objective faults in the realm of traversal fluidity. The, the guy inside tried to kill me. Sure. 
one team up. Yeah. Thank you. You can take the loot. Coming over to GPU performance and visuals, a lot of people are also talking about how this game solves typical Unreal Engine 5 issues. It doesn't use Nanite Lumen GI or Lumen Reflections, and it does not use virtual shadow maps. These are heavy on the GPU and not without visual faults of their own and are the source of many complaints regarding UE5's GPU performance. Their absence in Arc Raiders is keenly felt in GPU limited performance. Playing the game GPU Limited unlocked frame rate at native 1440p DLIA on an RTX 4060 maxed out. Indoors performance is between 50 and 60 FPS, even while in combat. And on the heaviest level for the GPU, this blue gate level, it will at worst be in the low 40s in vegetation dense areas. This is all native rendering resolution, by the way. This is dramatically different than a typical UE5 game that uses UE5's headline features. Contrasted with something more typical like the Outer Worlds 2, for example, that game maxed out at epic settings, has indoor scenes at 1440p DLAA running at around 20 FPS on the same GPU, and in outdoor scenes with vegetation, it goes down to 15 or 16 FPS at worst. So with Arc Raiders, we're talking about a game that has three times the frame rate at native 1440p than something like The Outer Worlds 2, a game that does use the UE5 headline features. That is definitely a positive for performance, and I can understand why people can really like that. But in my opinion, we should not act as if all max settings, all epic settings, are exactly the same here. Arc foregoing Lumen, VSMs, etc. does have ramifications for its visual quality. Basically what I want to say is you can understand why the game runs so much better on GPUs in a number of instances. Take Shadows. Maxed out in Arc Raiders, there's a lot of game light sources which are non-shadow casting or only use screen space shadows. Or objects like grass don't cast any shadows at all, looking quite odd. You can also see that max shadow map resolution is quite low, especially with sun or spotlight shadows, where they are filled with aliasing and look blobby. The shadows also show off some quite obvious cascading and detail scaling issues when you walk through the world, popping in and out and showing that resolution line flowing through them as you get closer. If you used Unreal Engine 5's VSMs here, many of these issues would not be visible, although of course at a frame rate cut. Then you have the bounce lighting in the game. There's no obvious light boiling and smearing like we see in Unreal Engine 5 games using Lumen, but this game only uses RTX GI, which is a pro-based RT solution, and has many other faults in the place of its stability. Take reflections. They are purely in screen space, and many times the reflections have little to no competent cube map fallback. This makes metallic or water surfaces look like something you'd see on a PS4 or Xbox One. With the diffuse lighting, RTX GI definitely doesn't have boiling occurring, and you get some nice larger scale bounce effects, but the bounce lighting is limited by the fidelity of the RT probes, and they are definitely prone to error. Many smaller objects completely lack any grounding shadows, even with the game's SSAO. And although you definitely get bounce lighting in the game, anything thin or small has light leaking through it from the other side. So many of the game's indoor structures can typically have the blown out sky color on the inside of their walls or in their corners. So you see a lot of light leak in the game. And in a similar fashion, if the RT probes intersect with objects in a strange way, this can also lead to areas where all the indirect lighting disappears and creates black holes underneath objects. The reason why I'm talking about this is because I want to contextualize Arc's performance, as if being light on the GPU is not just a straight win. Rendering in real time always represents a set of trade-offs. Arc Raiders definitely runs phenomenally well, maxed out on low-end GPUs at native res like the RTX 4060, but in context, you can kind of see why it does. It has its own set of visual rendering issues that it gains in order to run better. It's a trade-off. In the case of this game specifically though, given its multiplayer focus, I think the choices they made are reasonable and advantageous. For one, the game, even without those technologies, still looks really good, and I think all the footage definitely shows that off. And the developers not designing the game around Lumen or VSM means they can broaden the audience who can run the game. You don't require nearly as much upscaling on lower end GPUs to make this game run well. I would consider those generally positive things. So to answer the second part of my question I posed at the beginning of this video, yes, 
Ark Raiders does avoid usual pitfalls of Unreal Engine games in its visuals and in its GPU performance. Low-end GPUs can run the game at native resolution really easily. It runs a lot better than other UE5 contemporaries on the GPU, but at the same time, its compromises for performance are readily visible. It lacks visually in other areas where other games might excel that use those standard UE5 features. Okay, enough about the game's visuals and performance. Let's talk about optimized settings on the GPU. And I actually don't have that many optimized settings in this PC video because the game already runs so fine, even maxed out. Two basic ones I have are centered around RTX GI. Here you can turn down the RTX GI setting from Dynamic Epic to Dynamic High with little to no visual consequence. And in doing so, you'll gain back 12% performance on the GPU. Same with the Global Illumination Resolution setting. Here you can knock that down to high with very little difference in visuals and gain a similar 12% performance on the GPU. In a scene like this, those two small setting tweaks for optimized settings can improve performance in total by 24%, which is sizable given the invisible visual difference typically. With that, a GPU like the RTX 40 60 could and should further leverage DLSS in quality mode over DLAA and get great performance above 60 FPS at nearly all times in the game. Even when playing the game on the taxing blue gate level with all of its thick underbrush and forest, I still didn't really go below 60 FPS at all times, even in combat. Coming to the end of this video, I do think some of the hype around Arc Raiders and its performance is very justified. It does run a lot better than a lot of other Unreal Engine 5 titles. It has acceptable GPU performance, it has great baseline CPU performance on modern CPUs, and it has no shader compilation stutters. It also has some other niceties that I like, such as the performance readout that I used in this video to talk about frame times. Still, it has some weaker points for sure. While not as bad as other titles, traversal stutter is definitely in this game and it can be found in your frame times or in the game's animation depending upon whether or not you cap the frame rate. Another issue comes in the setting scaling. If you have a low-end GPU in this game, it of course runs fine maxed out basically, and honestly, it's already optimized in that sense. I don't have to do too much here. The reason why it's optimized is because its max settings are just the medium of any other title when you think about it. It has SSR and shadow map issues quite commonly, and while I do appreciate RTX GI being here, it is definitely lacking in comparison to per pixel techniques. So its performance makes a lot of sense. Here, I think it would be wonderful if they added in some higher end scaling for high end GPUs, like an insane setting preset with a warning when you turn it on so you know that it means business. You know, something that adds in RT reflections, shadows, or a per pixel GI solution to really spice things up and set the game up for the future. As it is though, right now, even without that, the B-roll shows that this game is already quite good looking, and I don't think many users care that its ultra settings are essentially the medium of another game. Anyway, that's enough from me for now. Like, subscribe, ring the bell, follow on social media, and as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen.